Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online class. And today we're covering Introduction to the Human Body, Part 2. So most of this PowerPoint I covered in my first video lecture. Um, so we actually going to start right where we uh, left. And that this is going to be our first slide. So uh, standard anatomical position, body erect, feet slightly apart, palms facing forward with thumbs pointing away from the body. So if you look, uh, if you look at the next slide, um, this um, guy here, um, he's in anatomical position. He's erect, eyes and palms facing forward, feet are slightly apart and thumb is pointing away from the body. Um, now, anatomical position is your point of reference. And so whenever you describe uh, your patient, uh, maybe um, some injury, um, some uh, landmarks, position of um, your patient body parts, you're always referring to anatomical position. Now, directional terms, describe one body structure in relation to another body structure. And um, we have directional terms, we have regional terms. Um, so regional terms are regions on, on the body that we wanna keep, we wanna keep a uh, language of anatomy uh, universal. So people from different countries, uh, from different background, doesn't matter where they study, anatomy and physiology or medicine, when they talk to each other, they can understand. So we need a common language between medical professionals. Uh, and that's why we want these body parts um, sound and be named the same, uh, doesn't matter what language, uh, and, uh, what language you use to study anatomy in anatomy class, right? That makes sense, right? That make it um, more universal, understandable, easy to communicate uh, between um, uh, healthcare professionals and it's all benefit uh, a patient, right? So directional terms and regional terms uh, describe uh, body is a direction of parts in relation to another body structure. Direction is always based on standard anatomical position. Right and left refer to the body being viewed or your patient, not your right or left. Okay, so if we look here, we can see uh, this um, gentleman uh, in anatomical position and um, this is anterior or ventral view. This is posterior or dorsal. Now, if a body is not erect, have a patient uh, laying on its uh, belly, for example, then it will be a prone position. And if patient is um, laying on the back, then we say it's, it's a supine position. The body is in supine position. So those are another um, terms that describe uh, body, position of the body. Right. Okay, so let's um, um, try to do it um, kind of quickly because here, um, what we need, we need um, just pretty much uh, memorization of these terms. Um, nothing here that I really need to explain. You just guys need to try to memorize um, these names. Um, so this is a cephalic region or a head of a patient. And the neck is referring to a cervical. Uh, and of course, we have anterior uh, cephalic and posterior cephalic uh, view. Um, and here's the body regions, uh, orbital, nasal, oral, mental, where the chin is. And in the posterior view, um, we can see occipital and otic. So otic is where ear is and back of the head is occipital. Um, then uh, cervical, we already mentioned, is the uh, neck region. So anterior cervical, posterior cervical. Uh, thoracic region that will include sternal, axillary, mammary, um, 
this uh, tip of the um, shoulder is acromial. Um, and acromial is pretty much as a part of upper limb, yeah, I would say. So in the thoracic, we have sternal, axillary, and mammary. Um, and, and we have abdominal here. Let's cover abdominal, and then we will get back to the dorsal view. Uh, abdominal region include umbilical. Also, you have pelvic region and inguinal and pubic. Um, now, inguinal um, region shows here kind of like this inferior part, but it it more like um, this line over here. You have inguinal canal, so it more um, this region that I'm showing you right now than. Um, this just below the pelvic, right? So this would be inguinal, this would be inguinal, this will be a pelvic region, and this is a pubic or genital. Now on the back side, uh, you have a vertebral, a lumbar, and a scapular. This is where the bone is, that's called scapula. Uh, sacral right here. Now, if we move to the upper limb, we have acromial, brachial, uh, anticubital, antibrachial, uh, carpal, and uh, manus or hand that include pollux or uh, your thumb, a palmar region, and digital region, those are your uh, fingers. Now on the posterior view, acromial is still the same, brachial the same, antibrachial is the same. So to distinguish, you can just say anterior brachial or posterior brachial, anterior antibrachial, posterior antibrachial. Now where we have um, uh, this region over here, anticubital, we actually have a lacrimal over here. Um, we have... Um, carpal region over here where you have carpal bones and on the dorsal side you have metacarpal region uh, pollux is the same digital region is the same um, now when we move to the low limb uh, we have coxal femoral patella um, then this anterior part is called crural and on this side, it's called lateral side, is uh, either you can call it fibular, um, right, or peroneal. I like fibular because that's our uh, bone over here, the fibular. Uh, in pedal means foot, so you have your um, tarsal region, uh, metatarsal region, digital, and holix. Um, that's a, a big toe. Um, and on the posterior view, um, so first we have a gluteal region. This is where you have your gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus is muscle. Gluteal is a region. Uh, femoral is the same. All right, so again, that's a posterior femoral. Uh, where we have on the anterior side, we have patellar. On the posterior, we have popliteal. Um, now we have crural to the front and on the posterior side, on the back, we have sural and fibular again on the side, on the lateral side. Calcineal is your heel and plantar uh, is your sole. Um, I think pretty much um, we covered all of this terminology, so please make sure you memorize them. Okay, so here's our next slide uh, where we're talking about directional terms. Um, so again, directional terms are referring to anatomical position, essential for describing relative location. Um, now, um, towards the head, we have cranial and um, towards the you know, 
tail that we don't have. We have caudal, but caudal means a tail. We also can call it superior and inferior. Uh, to the front is anterior or ventral. To the back is posterior or dorsal. Um, now, um, if you make a midline right in the middle of the body, so everything that close to midline will be medial, away from midline will be lateral. And uh, when you talk about upper and low limbs, only upper and low limb, we use proximal and distal. So again, proximal and distal. And proximal is close to the torso, attachment to the torso, and distal is uh, further away. Now, you do not, if you're talking about uh, this um, axle part of the body, you do not use proximal and distal. Then you use is a, a cranial caudal or superior and inferior. But when you talk about limbs, you use proximal and distal. So example would be, let's say patella. Uh, patella is, um, for example, um, you compare, you always need two structures because um, this is a relative directional terms. So let's say we take patella and we will uh, take um, tarsal bones. So tarsal bones right here, patella is here. Patella is proximal and tarsal bones are distal. Right, but um, if you um, take umbilical cord, right? So uh, umbilic uh, umbilicus, it's not a cord, <laughs> umbilicus, right? And sternum, so sternum is superior, umbilicus is inferior. Um, this is, uh, again, if you look at the sternum, sternum will be anterior and vertebral column will be a posterior. We do have other terminology. It's not shown over here, but we have deep and superficial. I think it's important to know. Superficial means close to the surface of the body and deep is um, deeper in your body. So it's away from the surface. So for example, your skin is superficial to your muscles. Your muscles are deep, skin is superficial. Um, so we use imaginary planes to divide your body into uh, sections. So three most commonly used planes are now this one right in the middle. It's a sagittal. When it's right in the middle, it's called mid-sagittal. When it's um, off um, midline, then it's parasagittal. Then this one over here is frontal, this one frontal or coronal, and this is transverse. So you can see transverse plane divides your body into superior and inferior part. Um, uh, sagittal plane divides your body into right and left and coronal into anterior and posterior. Uh, what I forgot, by the way, uh, to mention um, on this previous slide that here's our right and this is left. Right? So that's the left of the patient and this is the right of the patient. Um, sorry, wrong way. So when we're talking about mid-sagittal, we divide into right part of the patient and left part of the patient. We also can have um, oblique uh, plane. So all these planes, they cross each other at a right angle at 90 degree. If you have any plane that is not at a right angle to any of these three planes, that is gonna be oblique. So it's, it's cut your body. Um, into, um, into the uh, section that are not, um, uh, uh, perpendicular to this uh, three most, uh, most commonly used planes, right? So it's got your body at angle, any angle that will be oblique. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so anyway, uh, on this slide, you can just see those planes um, shown separately that I think uh, give a better, little bit better understanding. So here's our sagittal, specifically mid-sagittal, uh, coronal or frontal and transverse. Um, also, your body has uh, cavities um, and you need cavities to 
uh, hold your internal organs inside them. Um, body cavities are spaces that houses internal organs. Um, Cavities are divided into dorsal body cavities and ventral body cavities. So in the back, uh, you have your cranial cavity and vertebral cavity. And the organs that are found inside or located inside those cavities are brain inside cranial cavity and spinal cord within vertebral cavity. Now, ventral body cavities are divided into a thoracic cavities. So this all all this part over here is a thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, thoracic cavity is divided into um, smaller uh, spaces. Um, this shown in orange is called superior mediastinum, pericardial, and two pleural cavities. Um, inside pleural cavities, you have lungs. So you have right lung inside right pleural cavity and left lung inside left pleural cavity. You have heart inside pericardial cavity. And you have in a superior mediastinum, um, you have large blood vessels like uh, aortic arch, uh, superior vena cava. Um, you also have uh, trachea here. Uh, thymus, right? So that's, you know, the organs uh, that inside the superior mediastinum. Um, abdominal pelvic cavity. Oh, yeah. And I forgot to tell you that um, what divides thoracic cavity from abdominal pelvic is diaphragm. So diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. So you have a muscle. Uh, it's a skeletal muscle similar to your like bicep brachii or rectus abdominis muscle. Um, similar muscle over here that's called diaphragm that um, separates thoracic and abdominal. Abdominal, abdominal pelvic divided into abdominal and pelvic cavity. In abdominal cavity, you have uh, what we call uh, viscera, um, lots of organs and part of digestive system. In pelvic cavity, you have uh, reproductive organs, uh, urinary bladder, and uh, the last part of GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, like uh, rectus. Um, right. Uh, a clinical considerations over here or imbalances. Um, the pelvic bones provide limited protection to pelvic cavity. Um, right, so if you look, you know, well, let's just kind of look at protection of this cavity. So if you have your cranial cavity, uh, you have your skull that protects your brain, you know, pretty good. Then vertebral cavity, again, protects your uh, spinal cord. Then you have your rib cage or thoracic cage um, that made of ribs and uh, sternum and you know, part of the vertebral column, and you protect your um, organs with the thoracic cavity. Then you have a pelvic bones, um, right? That's will, pelvic bones will make your pelvis, and it does protect limited protection. It provides limited protection to your pelvic organs, but abdominal cavity are really protected by muscles only. Um, and that's why organs in this area are most vulnerable to trauma. So that's uh, abdominal cavity that has your liver, stomach, large, small intestine, and you do not have bony protection, but that gives you a lot of uh, movement, ability to move freely and reduce your overall body weight, um, can you imagine if you would have like complete bony structure protecting your entire body? Yeah, you will. You would gain some protection, but you would lose in your mobility, right? Uh, but that's why if um, you know if somebody in a car accident, um, that's the area that can be uh, damaged because of limited protection. Um, also, abdominal pelvic area is divided into quadrants. 
Um, so the easy quadrants are these four quadrants here. Uh, we have upper, two upper and two lower quadrants, right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower, and abbreviation are RUQ, LUQ, RLQ, LLQ. Um, and this is used um, by medical professionals a lot. Right, so if you're a doctor or a nurse, then you divide it into quadrants. In anatomy, we like um, to divide it into smaller region and more specific, um, like nine quadrants. And you can see um, we have a hypochondriac, right and left, uh, epigastric, uh, right and left lumbar, umbilical region, right iliac, left iliac, and hypogastric. Now, epigastric, gastric means um, stomach. So this kind of tells you, well, it's above the stomach, epigastric, and this is hypogastric below the stomach. Um, this one, hypochondriac, and um, Chondra means cartilage, so it's a uh, below this uh, costal cartilage, right? And iliac, um, you have a bone, um, the biggest bone of your pelvis that is ilium, so it's an iliac region. <clears throat> so those names um, have uh, some meaning. Uh, now, if you look at this diagram here, you can see major organs that are located in those quadrants. For example, liver, right? Liver is located mostly in the right upper quadrant. Um, here's a gallbladder, right? That is located in the right hypochondriac quadrant. Um, so that's a stomach, mostly in the left upper quadrant. Um, then, um, for example, appendix right there in the right iliac region. Uh, urinary bladder is located into hypogastric region, or if you're talking about four quadrants, it's a between uh, RLQ and LLQ. So it's in the both right and left lower quadrants. Uh, now, when we're talking about um, those, um, I will go back. Uh, when we're talking about abdominal pelvic cavity, um, and I, I mean, not only abdominal pelvic, all this ventral body cavities, right? When we're talking about all this ventral body cavities, so not dorsal, not cranial and vertebral, but thoracic and abdominal pelvic, um, um, we, um, there is a membrane. There is a membrane that covers those um, cavities and membrane cover that covers organs within those cavities, right? So for example, you have heart, right? So you have a cavity, pericardial cavity, and you have a membrane covering this cavity and you have membrane covering your heart, right? Or you have liver in abdominal cavity. So you have membrane covering the cavity and membrane covering your liver, right? That makes sense? And um, this membrane is called serous membrane or serosa. It's a thin double layered membrane that covers surfaces in ventral body cavity. And when we're talking about serosa, it always has two layers. Parietal serosa lines internal body cavity walls and visceral serosa covers internal organs, viscera. Viscera is a name for internal organs, and visceral serosa is this membrane covering the organs. Double layers are separated by slit-like cavity filled with serous fluid. Um, so here you have analogy of how this serous membrane works. So imagine you have a balloon, and you're going to put your fist inside the balloon. And what's gonna happen? One part of the balloon will enhance, so it will cover your fist, then it will be some space and another yeah, wall of the balloon, right? Now here you have air. You do not have air in the, um, uh, in the uh, cavities, right? Um, in the serous cavities. But if you imagine now, instead of the fist, you have the heart, 
So it will be a membrane covering your heart itself. And this will be visceral uh, serous membrane. Then you will have a space and you have another membrane that is parietal membrane, right? So we have visceral cover the heart and parietal cover the cavity itself. And between them, we have a, a serous fluid, right? So right there. Um, now, why we call it pericardium all of a sudden, but not a serosa? Well, first I wanna tell you, this is the serosa. So this is the serous membrane, but because you have so many different organs, this serosa is changing its names. Um, so for example, when this serosa cover your heart and the cavity where your heart is located, we call it pericardium. So pericardium cover your heart. Uh, when this serosa covers your lungs, right, right there, and the cavities where lungs are located, we call it pleura. So this is the pleural cavity, and we have um, visceral pleura covers your lung, parietal pleura covers the cavity, and between them we have um, serous fluid. Now, if you have serosa covering your digestive organs, so right there, it covered your liver, large, small intestine, right? We call it peritoneum. Uh, and that's in abdominal pelvic cavity. So serosa named for specific cavity and organs that they are associated with. All right, so that's the same membrane, but different names. Pericardium, when it's associated with your heart, pleura, when it's in association with your lungs, and peritoneum, when it's with association, uh, in association with your uh, abdominal and pelvic organs, All right? So here's some uh, clinical uh, application. Serous membranes can become inflamed as a result of infection or other causes. Normally, smooth layers can become rough and even can stick together, resulting in excruciating pain. Example would be uh, pleurisy and peritonitis. So pleurisy, inflammation of pleura, so that's a serous membrane inflamed uh, where your lungs are, peritonitis, it's an inflammation of the serous membrane in your abdominal pelvic cavity. So you can see over here, uh, pleurisy, example of the pleurisy, you have normal lungs and lungs with pleurisy. Um, so here we have infl inflammation of serous membrane. It's also uh, show you uh, pneumothorax um, when there is a, you know, leakage of the air inside this pleural cavity. Right, but um, um, just if you look over here, you see this uh, pleural membrane shown here in red instead of here, it's nice and blue. Now it's shown here in red, show you this is inflammation and this is pleurisy. And uh, we already talked about imaginary body planes and how you can imaginary cut your body into different sections, but we use it in the medical imaging. Um, so if you look at the uh, some uh, corresponding MRI scans, um, they corresponding to these um, uh, planes, right? So if you have mid sagittal plane, this is how the image of the abdominal pelvic cavity will look like. Here you show your thoracic cavity and part of abdominal cavity in the coronal plane, and this show you um, uh, that's a liver spleen. Right, so that's our abdominal cavity in a transverse uh, um, or cross section. Cross section and uh, transverse plane is used. Um, so you have a plane, right? And plane make a cut and cut produce a section. So mid sagittal plane make mid sagittal cut and making the uh, mid sagittal section or frontal plane makes frontal cut and give you a frontal or coronal section. Transverse plane uh, give you a 
transverse cut um, and uh, what we call transverse section or cross section. Um, now, um, different imaging, a type of imaging techniques, um, you can compare over here, we have CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, and X-ray. All of them have their advantages and disadvantages and common use. Um, so let's uh, briefly look at advantages and disadvantages of these different um, um, imaging um, techniques. So CT scan um, is a fast, uh, retailed images in three dimensions, uh, but disadvantage, it requires the most radiation. A chest CT is equivalent to about 100 chest X-rays. And common use um, detecting solid tumors and other problems with abdomen and chest. MRI can be more detailed than CT and uses no radiation. It's using actually the um, magnetic field. Um, However, it's more expensive than CT, requires patient to remain still for a half an hour or more. So it takes time, it's expensive. Um, and commonly used is detecting brain abnormalities and diagnosis soft tissue injuries. Um, ultrasound cheaper than CT and uses no radiation, similar to MRI but it gives us lower image quality than CT. This effectiveness largely depends on technician skills. Uh, common use fetal ultrasound and diagnosis of appendicitis in children. X-ray is fast and cheap with a relatively low radiation dose, but provides only 2D image compared with 3D image for T, uh, CT scan with far less details than other methods, uh, used for diagnosis of broken bones, pneumonia, and intestinal blockage. Right, so you can see that um, we're lucky to have all of them, right? So um, uh, for example, if you have a patient with um, uh, what you believe is a stroke, right? Uh, first, they're gonna do very quick CT scan, right? Um, and uh, we'll try to um, uh, locate where the blockage is of the stroke, uh, but then um, they will do MRI uh, to see a better picture and see, you know, because MRI is um, usually used for you know, brain abnormalities and stroke is the <laughs> um, problem with the blood vessel in. Um, in the brain, right? Anyway, okay, so um, so over here, you can also see that um, there is another uh, type of imaging technique, uh, not MRI, but a, a PET, a PET scan. So PET scan is mostly used for, um, um, you know, study functions more than just a structure. Um, so uh, it provides information of function rather than structure. Uh, radioisotopes are injected into a body and emit particles that collide with electrons in body tissues and release gamma rays, similar to X-ray. And these gamma rays relate to a computer which construct PET scan. Um, right, so over here, uh, you see the same patient uh, that first was, um, uh, they, uh, they tried to diagnose it using CT scan, and it's a lung cancer uh, with liver metastasis. So you don't see lungs, but you see liver over here. And really, CT scan doesn't show you much. You cannot, you cannot see it because that's the area where metastases are that are not detected by CT scan, but uh, it's easily detected on a PET scan right here. Um, right, because cancerous cells, um, they are very metabolically active, so they actually um, require 
um, you know, there's a lot of uh, action going on over here and PET scan um, really um, very good at detecting the um, high metabolically active area of the body. All right, so um, in addition to all these imaging techniques, we also can use a PET scan um, to verify our diagnosis. Let's see if it's, that's it. Yeah, this, this is the last slide. Um, um, so please make sure you watch both uh, parts of this chapter, uh, introduction part one and introduction part two. And thank you for watching. And I hope it was helpful.